And uh, we're we going to start today with something that is, I, I know for many of you, you, you may be here today and you might not be married, or you may, you may have been married at one time, but you're not married now, or you've been through a series of marriages and, and you're either in one or you, you know, you're headed towards something or you're praying about something and most of us are really desiring relationships in our life because God built us this way. God placed us on this earth with a desire for someone to be in our life to help fulfill and complete and encourage our life to go on and be better than it ever would have been for us alone, to be a team that we can work together, that we can be much better together than we could have been alone. And, and, I, and I can just testify this uh, because Pastor Tanya and I have been married uh, 41 years. Yeah, so we've been together a long time. And the Lord has used that. And I, I know you obviously, anybody that, that worships here with us or is here at any length of time, you know, we're, we're, we're different from each other, really. We're, uh, Tanya's a, an administrator, and she's very organized and very planned, and, and she has every, you know, I dotted and every T crossed, and, and she takes care of those kind of things that need somebody to plan it so that other people can be involved and other things can happen, and that's well done, and that it's, everybody's taken care of and all of that. I, I on the other hand, I'm a fly by the seat of your pantser, you know, and I'm a lot more spontaneous, you know, and I'm, I'm usually more uh, creative in that way because it just spontaneously comes out. Well, over 41 years, uh, what the Lord has done is he's taught Tanya to be more spontaneous and he's taught me to be more organized. And so what he's done is he's blended us together so that the best traits of us both have been transferred from one to the other. And, and so the new creation that God made when he put us together is a better creation than I was alone or that Tanya was alone. That when we became one, God said that he created a new creature. That means this, this creation has never existed before. When we walked up to an altar and stood before a pastor, there was a creation called Keith and there was a creation called Tanya. When we walked off of that altar, there was no more a creation called Keith and a creation called Tanya, but we have a Keith Tanya, you know, we have a, this is a brand new creation. Yeah, yeah. The vows were spoken and the commitments were way, made and the I do's and the I wills and the covenant was made. And God said, boom, now a brand new creation exists that's never existed before. And walk away from here is that brand new creation in me. Yeah, yeah. The problem we have is that no matter which side of the human race you find yourself on, male gender or female gender, you find the other side of this, of this gender issue um, mysterious. Men, do you understand women? Now, before you start lying and say yes, I'm just going to tell you, if somebody says yes, you, you, need to, you, you don't need to trust this person anymore, okay? Because, yeah, if they'll lie about that, they'll lie about other stuff, won't they? Right, yeah, yeah. Men, we men have a saying, ladies, kind of behind the scenes. We wouldn't say it to you, but we men kind of have a saying uh, especially with each other mumbling under our breath, something like, hmm, women, can't live with them, can't live without them, you know. And guys, just so you'll know, women also have a saying. I don't know if you're aware of this. Women saying is, uh, men, can't live with them, can't shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> but we all are expressing the same thing, and that is uh, we don't understand each other. Because God has somehow created uh, distinct genders of humanity that are, that are not alike at all. Uh, uh, look, look at this passage. This is uh, uh, speaking in Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. 
and I'll make him a helper that's comparable to him. And so it was God's intention, it was God's design to create us the way he created us. It was a very unusual circumstance. I don't know if you're aware what kind of sense of humor God has. I know that most people think of God as this big cosmic party pooper that sits in the sky who looks down at us and says, hey, are you having fun? And we say, yeah, God. He said, well, cut it out. You know? As if somehow God's intention is to make life as miserable as he can for us and to be this giant ogre that sits in heaven to make us miserable. But, but here in the very beginning, when God first created everything, the Bible says that God looked down on man that he had already created. And God said, you know, it's not a good thing for man to be alone. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but God made really a statement to men. And, and I'll just show you what God did and how creative God is. God made, God made the statement to man, look in verse 19, very first next verse, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. You know, that's really amazing, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, we live in a world today that really wants to deny the existence of God and, and bring into question anything about God, especially anything about the Bible, what the Bible has to say. And they tell us that we as humans evolved onto this earth and that somehow we all came from some single cell amoeba, I guess, that uh, lived on a meteor, which is a flying ball of fire, which that's really hard to understand how that amoeba could live on a flaming ball of fire, but somehow it did and uh, jumped here and then it developed for one cell at a time over millions and millions of years and so forth. And then one day developed up and became a, a, a functioning human being, uh, walking upright. And they called him Neanderthal uh, or Neanderthal. I'm, un I'm understanding nowadays is the way they pronounce it. But but the point being Cro-Magnon, Magneton, uh, there's these, these crazy uh, developments of humanity that you see on that little chart somewhere. And and I'm just amazed. This is just amazes me because this verse says that all the animals God created on the earth, he brought them to Adam, the first man on the earth. And he said, now, Adam, what do you want to call these things? And then Adam said, well, God, that looks like a rhinoceros. That's an ostrich. That's an armadillo. You know, that's a hyena. That's a lion. I mean, God, Adam looked at all of the creatures on the earth. Just think what a just think what a provocative imagination you'd have to have to name all the creatures on the earth. And here's the most amazing thing: he remembered the second time he saw them what he named them the first time he saw them. Now that's amazing cognition for a Neanderthal man, in my opinion. And so God brought all these animals. Now think about it. Here's what, here's what God said. God said to Adam, you know, Adam, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, man. I, I know you've looked around and I know that you see all the animals on the earth have a companion that's just like them. And I know you've noticed that. I've know you, I know you've seen it. You know, the rhinoceros has, a, has a, a daddy rhinoceros and a mama rhinoceros and the giraffe have a daddy giraffe and a, and a mama giraffe and the ostrich has a mama ostrich and a, ba and a, and a, and a, and a daddy ostrich. And, and you've looked at all these and, and, and every creature on earth has somebody just like them except you. And I know it's not good for you to be alone, so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a creature for you that is just like you, that is comparable to you. And then all of a sudden, Adam says, hot dog, God, bring her on. <laughs> hey, hey, woohoo! let's see what God can do with this situation. And then all of a sudden, Adam begins to look and down the aisle or through the you know, path in the woods, comes, you know, a, 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 a mama ostrich and a daddy ostrich and a mama rhino and a dad. And, and as Adam begins to look at him, Adam says, well, God, that doesn't look like anything like me. That looks like a rhinoceros. That looks like an, that looks like an armadillo. That looks like an orangutan. That, you know, God, there's nothing for me. And imagine how disappointed Adam was that God had made this promise. I'm going to create something just like you for you. And then all of a sudden, God begins to bring the animals by. And Adam is, uh, is naming all the animals. So Adam gave names 
to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept, and he took out one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Let me just say here, this is a real good word for us guys. And that is the reason we don't understand women is because we were asleep when they were created. (laughs) Am I on my own, Bill? (laughs) Well, I mean, I know, you know, we, we can't understand. Well, it was a good reason for that. We weren't there when they were created. Oh, we were there. We just weren't conscious, you know, (laughs) all of a sudden. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to man. Wow. Here comes the good part. When God creates this this new creation that is comparable to man, he uses part of man. He takes part of man, and he builds this brand new creation that God said, this is a perfect, comparable being to you. And then all of a sudden, God, the first father, walks the first bride down the, down the Garden of Eden path. Imagine this. God, the Father, creating, uh, presenting the first bride to the first man and saying, here, here she is. Here, here's, here, this is for you. You're for her and she's for you. And Adam gets a look for the first time at this wonderful new creation. Provocative. Uh, and outstanding in every way. And then he makes his first public statement about this wonderful new creation of God. And when I read it in just a moment, you're most likely going to be completely underwhelmed. You know, great times call for great statements, right? I mean, when great things happen, we expect great statements. Like when... Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, and he stepped out on the moon, and his first words were, what? His first words were, one giant step, for, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Wow! Those are great words. That is exact, that is really great. Or, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but for what you can do for your country. Holy smokes, that's a great statement. Or, I have a dream that one day, little white kids and little black kids from the mountains of Georgia, I mean, those are great words spoken at an appropriate time, and we expect great things to be said when great things happen. So you would expect when God fulfills his promise to Adam and creates this perfect, comparable human being to him and brings him in all the majesty of the moment and all of the mystery that is unfurled there, you would expect Adam to come up with some tremendous words to say to mark this momentous occasion. And look what he said. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a little underwhelmed at that statement. I mean, mean, it's like, here she is, and then Adam goes into this uh, uh, this kind of a a scientific explanation of this. Uh, Well, she's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and... And she'll be called woman because she was taken from, the, from man. And, okay, good. All right. And, and you want to go, ooh, ooh. Now, the reason it seems this way is because uh, the Bible states it this way. And this is, this is what he said. I'm not saying this is not what he said. But when you read your Bible, you know, you, you, you can't, you don't know how it sounded. You don't, you don't know what kind of inflections and, and exclamations and intensity. And, you know, you're reading words on a page and, and, and you have a tendency to try to judge how, how they are by the context that they're in. But, but what I'm saying is that, that, that these words are much more dynamic than you think they are because uh, here's, what, here's what happened when God walked uh, Eve down the aisle. Adam turned around. 
And how many of you have ever heard a wolf whistle? <whistles> you know, <laughs> glory to God, that's what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. Man, that's more like it, God. That's what Adam said. That's what Adam said. Adam looked at God and he said, wow, God, that is what I'm talking about, baby. That's, woo wee you did good. And then he said, look, I've been looking at these orangutans and armadillos and elephants and rhinoceros. I've seen, you know, I've seen, I've seen big old wide animals. I've seen little old tiny animals. I've seen chipmunks. I've seen uh, monkeys. I've seen orangutans, gorillas. I've seen things that come pretty close. But I'm going to tell you, you know what I noticed about her? She has bones like my bones. That's what he's saying. He said, I've been looking at all these other bones, all these other animals, and their bones aren't like my bones, but wow, she has bones like my bones, except, whoo, I like her bones better than mine. <laughs> and she says, and she has skin like my skin. I mean, she doesn't have feathers, and she doesn't have a rough hide, and she doesn't have tusk, and she doesn't have, you know, these hairy things and all this kind of stuff. I mean, man, when I look at her, she has not only bones like my bones, she has flesh like my flesh, but I kind of like her flesh better than my flesh. And so God said, wow, yeah, whoa, man, whoa, man, yeah, that's right. That's what God, and, he, and, and God, and he named her, whoa, man, whoa, man. Now, this is, this is how God created genders of mankind. So what I'm saying to you is that it was in the heart of God all the time to create two distinct genders of humanity. As a matter of fact, let's see, I think the next verse. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him male and female. Created he them. Now I know in this age of, you know, uh, what is it, transmorphism and uh, uh, demonic intrusion or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, right, absolutely. Now, now we have people that think that they can transform into another gender. Now, I don't care what you think. You can't be another gender. Because every chromosome in your body, the basic building blocks of life, the DNA that's inside of you, and the chromosomes that exist out of that DNA are completely different from you. Males have an XY chromosome in every cell of our bodies, and females have an XX chromosome in every cell of their bodies. So you can clip some stuff off, you can add some stuff in, you can change some stuff, you can grow your hair out, you can paint your lips, you can do anything you want to, but you're not going to be made into something else. You are an XX or an XY for the rest of your life. That's all I'm telling you. And every cell in your body screams out, you're male or female, created he them. I don't care if you identify as a walrus. You're not, you're not. And just because you think you're something, that doesn't make you something. It's crazy. That's a goofy, demonic idiocy of life nowadays. Good night. I just want you to see that God did this on purpose. I mean, they, they, we're different by design, is what I'm saying to you. That God, I mean, it, it didn't slip up on God that he was creating two distinct genders of humanity. In other words, God says, we'll have masculine identity on earth, and we will have feminine identity on earth. So what I'm saying, this would be God speaking, what I'm saying is that there are certain qualities, characteristics, and desires that males will have that females do not have. And there are certain characters, qualities, feelings, insights, thoughts that females will have that men will not have. And God did that by design on purpose, right? And the genius of God 
is that he put us together in such a way that, we, that, that women would naturally be attracted to men and that men would naturally be attracted to women and that we would desire each other. If this weren't true, there would be no more humans on the face of this earth. The first generation would have been the last generation because we are so different that I'll guarantee you that we would not stay together had it not been for this intense uh, magnetic draw that God created between men and women, male and female. So I want you to say the phrase with me. That's kind of the theme of what we'll be talking about for the next couple of Sundays, this one and the next couple of Sundays. I want you to say this statement with me. Not wrong, Not wrong. just different. Just different. Not, wrong. <laughs> Not wrong, just different. Just different. Yeah. So when we have issues in life and we see these differences, and believe me, we're going to see, there are going to be seven things that I'm going to highlight for you that I think really are the seven real giant areas of life that all of us deal with all the time. And, and, and I'm going to help, help you see the difference between men and women so that when, that when that is exhibited, then you can know it's not wrong. <laughs> They're not trying to be obstinate. They're not trying to be difficult. They're not trying to be contrary. They're not trying to cause trouble. They're not, they're not trying to see things in a different way. They are different. And just because they're different doesn't mean they're wrong. It means that we have different uh, desires, different creations, different thoughts, different emotions, different points of view, different goals, different uh, needs from each other. Naturally, just diff we, we are different in every way. And so let's just start with the most obvious first because, uh, you know, this is, uh, I, I put this passage, it just basically is what Solomon's saying, that you're going to, if you're going to uh, have a good family, you're going to have to ask God for wisdom through skillful and godly wisdom. It's a family built and by understanding it's strengthened. I'm just saying that in order to understand the other side of this gendered issue in life, you're going to have to study it. You're going to have to try to understand it. You're going to have to be taught some stuff about it. And God's going to have to teach you some things. And God's going to have to put some things into your heart so that you'll do it. And if you'll do this, it'll strengthen your family. It'll strengthen your life. Whether you're young or old or anywhere in between, this is good stuff for you. Let's look at the first difference. First of all, we're biologically different. That goes in your blank. I know you're always looking to fill in your blanks. We're biologically different. Now, I know this, that, that this is obvious, and, um, and we obviously know that uh, as aesthetically, we're different. Yeah, you know, we don't, you can look at, at your mate, look at, look at the other gender of humanity, and you can see that there are ways that we look different in I had this really demonstrated. It was so funny. Last night, uh, we had a young lady, teenage, teenage young lady, come to our home to, to stay uh, with, 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 uh, with Kaylee. And, 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 and she came in, and she was just talking about stuff. And she said, you know, I have my eyelashes on. And you could look, and, you know, her eyelashes were very pretty and long and, you know, dark and all that kind of stuff. She said, I have my eyelashes on. And... Uh, and I said, y your eyelashes on? She said, yes. Uh, you know, I I've got these things, these, these extras struck, stuck to my, <laughs> to act to my eyelashes. And she said, I said, you do? And she said, yeah, and sometimes they bother me, and sometimes they hit my glasses and different things like that. So, well, why do you even wear them? And she said, well, do you want me to look pretty or what? <laughs> you know? And I thought to myself, well, now, there is a good example of an aesthetic difference between men and women. I mean, so obviously we have these aesthetic things. You know, I sometimes wish men we could wear some makeup and look better. I, you know, I don't know about you. I know that there are. I know that I. I know that there are a lot of people who really get down on this makeup thing for women. But I just want to stand as one man who says I really appreciate it. I, I'm moving. I mean, let me give you. Let me give you. Let me give you another. Let me give you another little thought. When you when you when you dig a hole, quit digging. Yeah, I just say okay. I'm moving on from that. But anyway, biologically, biologically we are different. And this is just like some of the things that I was mentioning to you a, a moment ago. Uh, and there are some things that are written on your outline that I wrote for you. 
And, and, and let's just look, I mean, look at a couple of them. The, the first finger of a woman's hand is usually long, longer than the third. And, and with men, the reverse is true. I don't know how many of you have looked at that and looked at your mate and all that. And I don't know whether it's true or not. Boys' teeth, <laughs> boys teeth last longer than girls' teeth. Women have larger stomach, kidney, liver, appendix, but smaller lungs than men. Women's lung capacity is about 30% less than men. I mean, they're just a whole list. Women have a better immune system than men. And ladies, you'll have no trouble believing this. It's not on the list, but you could write it there. And that is men have thicker skulls than you do. So when you look at him and say, how that old hard hit, I mean, that is, that is a biological truth. Women have more brittle bones. There's another one that's not there. That's why it's always a woman on the commercial that says, help, I have fallen and can't get up. <laughs> so there are lots of, <laughs> we are biologically different. And, and God did that on purpose. And to summarize this biological difference, every single solitary cell in a man's body is different from every single solitary cell in a woman's body. And so at the very basic building blocks of life, we are radically different. So what's the point of that? Well, if we are to live with our wives with a conscious awareness of the psychological, emotional, and, and physical differences by which God has created. Therefore, we are, 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 are to be more understanding, not wrong, just different. And men uh, say, thank God. <laughs> Wouldn't it be terrible if you had to wake up to yourself every day? <laughs> Wouldn't that be boring? Oh, yeah, would it, would it, yeah. And so, biologically different. Uh, uh, look, in the area of muscular strength, and I know this is maybe common to you, and you may already know this, but in the area of muscular strength, 40% of the typical male body weight is composed of muscle, while only 25% of the average weight of females is, is muscle mass. Well, the reason for this is that God designed men to be protectors and providers for their home and their family. That's what we are, guys. If you say, what is the role of a man in his family? You have three roles. You are the protector. That means you guard your family in every way. It's not your wife's responsibility to know where the kids go on the internet or what sites they're visiting or who's knocking on the door or who they're going to see and who they're hanging around with and what's happening with their social group. That's your job. You're the protector of the family. You wouldn't allow someone to come to your door, knock on your door, enter your home, who is some kind of weirdo, pervert, uh, reprobate. But, but, but you don't know that, that that's one of them. They're talking on the internet or some chat site or something. I, I'm just saying that the, the way you protect your family changes over life, you know, and you have to stay current. Because it's your responsibility to protect your family from every intruder, from every danger. And you are to provide for your family. That doesn't mean that your wife can't work. It doesn't mean that you're a loser if you need more income in your family and your wife uh, provides. It just means that you do everything you possibly can do to provide for your family. You uh, get a job. <laughs> get a job. You know, God, I, a lot of times people pray, Lord, I need more resources. Lord, I need, I need, a, I need a better life. I need to be able to pray. And, and, and God says back, hey, I got the answer to your prayer. Yeah. You know what? It, it's spelled with uh, four letters, W-O-R-K, work, work. That's the answer to your prayer right there. Get a job. Oh, get an education, train yourself. Oh, I know you might have to go to school at night and you might have to double up and you might have to work two jobs or whatever it might take. But, but you guys, it's our responsibility to, to, to move forward and to desire to be a better provider and to try to be a better provider and to work and train ourselves and become something and, and do better and walk forward and move up in life. That's, that's what we're designed to do. That's why God created us to be the provider, the protector and the provider. And then the priest of our home is the third thing. And that just means we're responsible before God for everything spiritual that happens in our home. That means we can't hide behind women and make them be the spiritual leaders of our home. 
They're not the ones that pray with the kids. They're not the ones that make sure they get up and let's get to church. And this, are you going to church today? You're going to stand before God one day. I'm going to tell you that. You decide who goes and when they go and let's get up out of that bed and we're going to church. Don't make your wife be the most spiritual person in the home, men. God's holding you accountable for that and you responsible because that's what he created. And he gave you more muscles and he gave you more muscle mass and he gave you more because you're going to have to be the one that carries the load, that pulls the weight, that works the long hours, that, uh, that has to be strong enough uh, uh, and intense enough to handle the pressures that God's going to lay on your family. So we're biolog physically different, biologically and with strength, muscle strength. As a matter of fact, I think uh, here's one, verse 7, 1 Peter 3, in the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives, treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life, and if you don't treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. Woo! -hoo! Everybody say, wow. wow. That's a word right there, right? All of us want our prayers answered, but God said, if you don't treat her right, you're not going to have your prayers answered. And, and, and this is just simply saying that men are stronger than women. It's saying she might be weaker than you are, and the, and the, and the reason a lot of times you'll hear grunts and growls from the women in the side of the conversation and the radical feminists and so forth is because you, uh, uh, you don't understand the term weaker. Weaker does not mean inferior. Weaker means you are just weaker physically, muscular-wise than men, generally speaking. And I know, let me just say this before we get too far along in all this, that when I speak of these differences, I'm speaking in generalities. You know this, right? It's not that every single woman on earth is weaker than every single man on earth, right? Right? You know, a woman power lifter can beat up Barney the dinosaur at any time, right? You know, you know this. Okay, so we're not, we're not, I, I know a lot of times when, when, when you have things like this and you say things like this, you start thinking in your mind, well, I know somebody that doesn't, I know that one. And you start kind of arguing with the point because you know somebody that's, that's, the, that's the con, that's this counter to whatever I'm saying. And so uh, work, work it, okay? I mean, kind of work it, all right? Uh, just understand that these are general generalities about men and women. And so muscularly, uh, women are just generally strong. And on any given day in the normal realm of life, uh, all things equal, men are going to be stronger than women are. All right, now, uh-oh, wait a minute. I'm not ready to go to that one. Look, <laughs> physical stamina. And I'm going to make it quick because I know we got to eat some, uh, some chili here just in a second. Physical stamina. Phys in the physical stamina area of life, it, generally, it just means that um, generally speaking, day-to-day, -day, uh, in basic life, uh, a man can outwork or outlast a woman, physically speaking. Man has more stamina than women, except in one case, in the area of shopping. It seems that women have been given a shopping gene that men do not have. I think it's on that extra leg of that chromosome, you know, we have the Y, we're missing the whole leg that has the shopping gene on it is what, what, I, what I'm thinking about it is. Now, don't try to hang with her shopping, now, God, because she'll outlast you any day of the week. But generally speaking, men, you know, generally speaking, I could work longer, harder, and uh, perform at a, at a, at a, at a peak uh, rate longer than Tanya can. Uh, on any given day, because that's the way God has designed. I mean, I have to be able to do this because I've got to provide for my family. I've got to protect my family. So God gave me the ability to last longer, to be stronger, to have more stamina, and to be able to hold up longer than, than, than my wife does. So I, on any given day, I'm going to be stronger, but it all balances out because she's most likely going to outlive me for, for, 
for about two to four years, I think is what the average is. Now I put five to 10 on your outline, but I think that's a dated uh, term. I think it's about two to four. But regardless of that, women live longer than men on a general speaking basis. Women are, men are built for the 100-yard dash and women are built for the marathon. If life was a 100-yard dash, men would win every time. But life's not a 100-yard dash. Life's a marathon. And so I, while I may be stronger, Tanya will be working 40 hours a week, two to four years after I'm in heaven somewhere if she really wants to. So we are physically different. Everybody say, not wrong, not wrong. just different. different. Right. Not wrong, just different. Now, in the second area of life, uh, it shows up really big. Uh, and and it, this is one of those ticklish ones, and I'm going to just hit it real quick. And let me just say this because I know I'll get to the end and I won't say it or I'll forget to say it or it won't be a, a good time to say it. What I have right here that I'm holding in my hands is a test that I've developed for romantic response. It's a true-false test. And I have enough for most couples to take home. I think maybe all of you. Uh, it's a front back. And I want you to, and here's what I want you to do. If you're interested in more than what I'm about to do, because we're in a congregation with children and teenagers and everybody else in here, I can't do certain things. I know I've made Tanya nervous about it because she's... <laughs> She's, I think on, last night she got on the phone and she called several of our leaders and said, uh, can you get the kids out of the sanctuary? Um, and I asked her, I said, babe, what you doing? I said, you, what do you think I'm going to say to these people? She said, well, I don't know. I was just looking at your notes. And I said, well, <laughs> and I said, well I'm going to be appropriate. I'm not going to get too far out, you know, in, in this thing, in a mixed congregation like this. You know, if we were at a seminar and it was only couples in there, I would go into some of this stuff that's in here. And, and this is really important stuff, and that's what I'm saying to you. And the only, the only uh, uh, requirement for you to pick this up is you've got to promise to get home by yourself at some time. Could be tonight when your children are in bed or whatever. And that you would read this out loud. And you would take this test together out loud. Read it out loud as if I'm saying it to you, because I am saying it to you. And it, it, it will get way, way more personal than anything I'm going to say to you now. But I want you to know that God created us different in the area of romantic response. The perfect example is in the book of Song of Solomon. How many of you have ever read the book of Song of Solomon? Okay, beautiful. If you've read the book of Song of Solomon, you'll recognize that it is a it is really poetry. It's biblical poetry, actually. It's written by Solomon, King David's son, that also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Proverbs. This is a poem that he wrote, and this poem is about a relationship between him and the love of his life. And so the book is very romantic, and just to let you know, the Jewish dads, the Jewish parents, would not let their children read this book until they had bar mitzvahed, which means they had become an adult. So this is a very provocative book, and it says very provocative things, and I doubt very seriously if all of us would be comfortable in this sanctuary if I just started reading this book out loud to you, to all of us in this sanctuary. You'd be blushing and snickering, and you know, because it's perfectly obvious there's some very stuff, tough stuff in there. But I want to use this to show you the difference, the romantic difference between men and women. Look in verse 1. This is the woman speaking. This is the love of Solomon's life. And see what she's saying. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. Okay, so you're feeling, you're feeling a little emotion already? You're feeling a little, oh, I can't find the one I love. All right. I will, I will rise now, I said, and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him. But I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. And I said, have you seen the one I love? Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. And I held him and I would not let him go. And then she described some further action that I put three dots on. <laughs> let me just say that this woman 
has romance on the brain. Can you, can you see this? I mean, you can feel the passion here, right? She starts out by saying, the one I love, I, I, I'm missing the one, and I ran through the streets, and I was yelling in the streets, have you seen the one I love? And the guys that were guarding the wall said, we hadn't seen either one you love. And she said, well, if you find him, you tell me, because I'm seeking the one that I love. I mean, you can feel the emotion. You can feel the, uh, the, the, the passion and the intensity of what, of what she's looking for. And she finally found him, and then she said, I'm never going to let you go on. So this is the response of the woman. Now, by contrast, I want you to see the way Solomon, the man, responds to her. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> You'll have to take my word for it. That's a compliment, okay? <laughs> That's a compliment. It means that that's long, black, illustrious hair, like these goats that they make. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins, and none of them is barren. Now, hey, have times changed or what? I mean, back then... You know, well, uh, now we're looking for a perfect 10, right? Back then, those guys were just looking for a woman with all her teeth. <laughs> but do you see, you, you see the, you see, you see, you see the difference here? I mean, she, she very emotionally, she's looking and she's saying, have you seen the one I love? And he's looking back and said, get a load of those teeth, would you? <laughs> She goes on to, he goes on to say, your lips are like a strand of scarlet and your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David built for an armory on which hang a thousand bucklers, all the shields of mighty men. <laughs> oh, mercy. <laughs> and then after verse four, it gets a little bit too deep for us. But do you see the difference here? She is describing romantically a deep emotional uh, uh, standard of, uh, of draw. She's emotional. She's related to her heart and, and her feelings are involved. Men, on the other hand, are generally stimulated by what they see. Ladies, that's why you can have a knockdown drag out fight and an hour later you go put on some skimpy something or another and your husband will see you and it'll be all over. Forget about the argument. <laughs> this is why, <laughs> this is why you and your husband can have a knockdown drag out and he can just walk away and, 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 and go play golf for 18 holes. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. The difference between men and women because God created us that way by design Men are created to be visually stimulated. That's why the trap from Satan is so easy to fall into. What is one of the major traps for, man, for men that Satan has used for, for, for eternity? Yeah, pornography. Presenting a false look at what a woman is supposed to be and how a woman is supposed to look and how relationships are supposed to be and how sexuality and romance are supposed to be and... The devil uses it because he knows that men are, are stimulated by what they see and they'll be drawn like a magnet to look at all of that. And they'll be enticed to look at all of that and they can almost not turn it away. It's very difficult. It's, it, it's fighting against the way we were created. So the problem with romance in a relationship is that both genders of humanity think that the other gender feels just like them. So here's what I mean. So men, we make a mistake when we're feeling romantic. When we're feeling romantic, what do we do, men? We do the Tarzan yell, beat on our chest, ah, and, 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 uh, and fly through me, Tarzan, you, Jane. I mean, you know, we're, 
we're, we're, we're wild and open like that. And, and she rolls her eyes thinking this guy has flipped out. <laughs> and he doesn't, even, he doesn't even have a clue what I need in life. He's about three French fries short of a Happy Meal. And, uh, <laughs> but ladies, you make the same mistake. Because when you're feeling romantic, what do you do? You turn down the lights and you light the candles. You put on the soft music and he goes to sleep. <laughs> what, we, what we ought to do is, ladies, when you're feeling a little frisky, you ought to ch do the Tarzan yell uh, and, 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 you know, and swing from the loop or something. And guys... You should light the candles and turn down the lights and play the soft music. That'll work. Not wrong, just different. But one thing, one thing's for sure, and I know we're going to look, we're going to look at a bunch more of these. But, but I want you to understand that even though God created us differently, we have the same responsibility before God. We have the same personal relationship with God. We have the same path to salvation with God. So no matter which side of the gender we fall on, although we are different in so many ways, there's one way in which we are exactly the same, and that is at the foot of the cross, we all stand equal at the foot of the cross. And we're all asked to have our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's not based on our feelings, and it's not based on our emotions, and it's not based on our intellect or how we were created. It's based on obedience to the Word of God. And the Word of God says, And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not may be, not might be, not probably will be, but you shall be saved. And the book of Romans says the reason why is because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us in this building are sinners. Every person that's ever lived on the face of this earth is a sinner, male or female, no matter who they are, except Jesus, obviously. And that's why we need a Savior, because we can't be perfect, because we can't live a holy life, because we have sin in our life, and we have come short of God's glory. And God has made a way for us to be saved through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you.